Hi everybody, uh, I'm Priscilla Strain with the Museum Center for Earth and Planetary Studies and we're just going to walk over now to the uh, Touch Rock and uh, uh, we'll talk about the, uh, that rock that came back from the moon. I'll admit, maybe it's not much to look at, maybe it's not too exciting looking, but when you think about it, it's really something quite amazing. When you touch it, you're touching something that came from 240,000 miles away. You're touching the past. It's 3.8 billion years old. You're touching a piece of another world. And it's only one of five other, uh, five rocks altogether uh, in the world that you can touch. And our rock was actually the very first one that people were allowed to touch. Uh, the other four are at the Macmillan Science Center in Vancouver, at the Museum of Science in Mexico City, at Johnson Space Center in Houston, and at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. And all of those rocks were cut from the same larger rock. This rock was collected in December 1972 on the Apollo 17 mission. Jack Schmidt and Gene Cernan collected over 700 different uh, rock and soil samples on that mission. And this is a piece of the very largest rock that they brought back. It was about yay big and about uh, 18, weighed about 18 pounds. Um, it was also one of the last rocks that was collected from the moon because it was collected at the end of their last traverse. Jack Schmidt had noticed the rock early on in the mission because it was large and it was not far from the lunar module, uh, only about 50 or 60 meters from the lunar module. And I have a picture here of it on the surface that I'll pass around so you can see uh, the actual rock where it was on the lunar surface. And I'll just pass that around to you. So Jack Schmidt said, let it be until later in the mission. And when they were coming back toward the limb on their last traverse, he asked Gene Cernan to stop the rover so he could get out and pick up this rock. And, uh, but as he was doing it, he inadvertently uh, kicked it underneath the rover. So uh, it was a little awkward to try to retrieve it. And so they had some jokes while they were doing it. He was down there trying to get it. And Gene Cernan was saying things like, uh, well, while you're down there, check my tires. And uh, uh, how's my transmission? And do we need an oil change? So, so they had some fun with it. The rock is called a basalt, which is a dark, colored, fine-grained volcanic rock rich in iron, magnesium, and plagioclase feldspar, which is a common rock-forming mineral on the Earth. Lunar basalts that were brought back from the moon are devoid of water. They're low in volatile elements. Those are elements that evaporate at low temperatures. And some of them, like our rock here, are very high in titanium compared to terrestrial basalts. And I probably should just clarify, because I do catch myself always referring to this as our rock, that um, it is actually on loan to us, as are all the other lunar samples in the museum, are all on loan to us from NASA. All the lunar rocks uh, belong to NASA. Okay, I think we could understand uh, this rock a little better if we look at the setting in which it was collected. So let's take a look at the landing site. If you all can see, um, the picture here. This dark round area is Mare Serenitatis, the Sea of Serenity. And um, let's see if this works. Yeah. Uh, and these mountains in a ring here are the rim of the Serenitatis Basin. The Serenitatis Basin formed about 3.87, 3.9 billion years ago by a huge impact into the lunar surface. And then for a very long time, it was just a big hole, a big basin on the lunar surface. Then many, many years later, lavas came up through cracks in the surface and filled in the basin, forming this dark, smooth plain. And these dark plains are the basalt rocks. You'll notice that the basalt plains are not all the same color. Some areas are lighter, some are darker. And especially right over here, there's a very dark area. In fact, it's one of the darkest areas on the moon, and that's the landing site for Apollo 17. And that's one of the reasons that it was chosen. 
When scientists looked at the photographs of this area, they thought they saw a very dark, smooth, dark mantling material, a place that was very smooth and didn't have a lot of craters, which indicated that it was probably very young. They saw lots of little craters with dark rims around them. They're called dark halo craters that they interpreted to be cinder cones. And they thought, oh, this is great. This is a place where there's really young volcanism going on. And so if we go here, this will be a great landing site because we can observe a very wide range of lunar history from very, very young volcanism all the way up to the very ancient rocks of the lunar highlands that would be found in the rim of the Serenitatis Basin. So let's take a closer look. This is Apollo an Apollo 17 metric photograph of the landing site area. It's called Taurus Litro for the Taurus Mountains, which are up here and actually way up there, and the Litro Crater, which is this crater here. Um, just for scale, uh, the Litro Crater is about 30 kilometers in diameter. Littrow Crater was named after Johann Joseph von Littrow, who was a, a, a 19th century uh, Czech astronomer. You can see the dark, the very dark Mare Basalt region. And the landing site itself, they landed actually right about, right about in here. And you can see that's a place with lots of interesting features. We have mountain here, the North Massif, and the mountain here is called the South Massif, and they're about two kilometers high. The red arrow is pointing at an area called the Light Mantle, and what this is, it looks like a landslide. It's where material from the top of the South Massif has actually fallen down into the valley floor. Now this is really great as for the astronauts because they can sample the top of this mountain, which is part of the rim of the Serenitatis Basin, without actually having to climb to the top, which would be pretty hard to do, pretty dangerous, and pretty time consuming. The blue arrow is pointing towards a feature called the lobate scar. And lobate scarves have been in the news a lot lately uh, because of the work of our, our, our very fine scientist right here at the Air and Space Museum, Tom Waters, who's been looking at these features using the uh, new imagery from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which is a, a spacecraft that's orbiting the moon right now, and it has a camera on it, uh, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter camera, uh, which is called LROC for short, and it's providing a lot of new high-resolution imagery of the moon. Tom's been looking at these lobate scarves, and he was able to find that they're globally distributed and that they indicate that the moon has actually shrunk a little, not a lot, but a little, in what is geologically fairly recent times. Well, this is the only lobate scarf that was ever visited by astronauts. And what it is, is it's called a thrust fault. And a thrust fault is formed by compression. And um, if you have um, two blocks, the block on top, which is called the hanging wall, in a thrust fault, moves up and over, is thrust up and over uh, the block below. And that's caused by compression. And that's what this feature is here. The astronauts were able to actually drive over part of it. So let's look a little closer now. These are images from the uh, LROC camera. And uh, this perspective view is very cool. It's made from um, two stereo photos uh, from the camera um, that were used to, uh, to make a digital terrain model. Uh, and the imagery was then overlaid over top of that. So it gives you a very, uh, very neat view of the valley floor. The arrow shows the landing site. And uh, you can see the lobate scar right here. And as it goes on up into uh, the North Massif, and you can also see the light mantle area, that landslide that we were talking about in the previous uh, picture. The vertical view on top uh, is really neat. It's very high resolution. You're getting um, 50 centimeters, half a meter per pixel uh, in this imagery. And you can see, actually see the descent stage of the lunar module. Um, and that's about eight pixels wide. 
So, so you're able to see that in this imagery. You can see the tracks of the rover. And in fact, our rock was picked up right about here. You can also see the places where the, um, the ALSEP instruments were put. The ALSEP is the Apollo Lunar Surface Experiments Package. Uh, and the geophone rock. And I have some pictures down here just to give you an idea of, uh, of what it was like on the surface. The geophone rock, and that's the um, lunar rover um, for scale, and some of the ALSEP instruments uh, here. So when they got the rock, uh, rocks back and they analyzed them, they found um, that actually the basalts were not so young as they had thought. 3.8 billion years old is actually very old for a lunar basalt. So the idea that they were going to see really young volcanism uh, just didn't happen. Um, and it turns out that the, uh, the dark halo craters that they thought were cinder cones were actually just small impacts that had excavated from a layer beneath that was darker and older. So when the, the um, crater impacted, the dark material came up made a dark ring around the crater, but they were just impacts. They were, they were not uh, young volcanic features. So even though they didn't find the young volcanism, the rocks did enable them to piece together the history of the area. And another example of that comes from the light mantle that we were looking at before, this landslide that came down the South Massif. Now what, what could have triggered this landslide? Well, if you look right at the very top of the South Massif, right above the landslide, you see a cluster of secondary craters. When a crater impacts the surface of the moon, material is ejected out, and sometimes when that material hits the surface, it forms a crater, and those craters are called secondary craters. The uh, secondary craters are very distinctive in appearance, so you can pretty much often figure out um, when craters are secondary craters. And these secondary craters are lined up right with the landslide. So it's very likely that this secondary impact was actually what triggered the landslide down the hill. Now we can date the uh, material of the landslide, how long it's been exposed on the lunar surface by looking at cosmic ray exposure ages. So by dating that line mantle, we can actually date the, uh, the impact, the secondary impact, and therefore the primary impact uh, that caused this landslide. Now the neat thing about this is that some scientists have looked at this and here these secondaries and the light mantle are lined right straight up on a ray of Tycho Crater. Tycho Crater is a very large, bright, very prominent cr young crater on the uh, lunar near side in the south. It has a very uh, prominent uh, ray structure, bright ray structure, radial rays coming out that extend for thousands of miles across the lunar surface. And sure enough, one of these rays goes right, is lined up right across the Apollo 17 landing site, right in line with the uh, secondaries and the light mantle. So you can't know for sure, but it certainly is possible that these secondaries were secondaries from Tycho Crater. And if that's so, dating the light mantle exposure ages, uh, we can date the uh, Tycho Crater event. And that comes down to 100 million years old. So, uh, which is pretty young in, in lunar terms. So that just gives you a little idea about the rock and the landing site. And if you have any questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer them now. Thank you for listening to this edition of Ask an Expert. A companion question and answer session for this lecture may also be available. For a schedule of upcoming Ask an Expert lectures at the museum, please visit www.nasm.si.edu.